acknowledge the recording. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, morning everybody from in St. Lucia and throughout the Caribbean. Um, I'm Richard Matthias and this is my co-host Rudy. I'm Rudy Rupka from yeah. England, uh, from Sitka Beekeepers. And I've been very privileged to be invited to come here to um, share some of my experiences and knowledge with the local Caribbean beekeepers. I've been keeping bees for about uh, 35 years, around around 100 colonies, uh, mainly for queen rearing, but uh, also for honey. So good. All right. Thank you, Rudy. All right. So we're going to keep it very efficient and tight today. Um, we're going to this morning, we're just going to run through a little bit of bee nutrition uh, feeding. and feeding. And then we are going to um, segue down to the bees and see how our graph went this morning. And then from our graph from yesterday, how it fared. And then we'll cut across. I think our guys from Argentina will be rejoining us. Uh, they're going to be very brief today, God willing. Um, and they're just going to quickly just answer some questions that may have been pending from yesterday so that we could um, uh, do a little follow up, follow through. Um, they may want to raise some more points based upon what the questions that we heard yesterday. So without further ado, um, I'm going to um, let really take control. Give me a second, please. Good. Somebody's a new generation. That's too nice. Okay. Okay. Let's do it again. Okay. Just about to meet himself. All right. So let's get our presentation up. Where is it? I can't wait to see our presentation. I'm just doing it like, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, my bad. Can you go back on? That it? That's it, yeah. yeah. Okay, ready. Well, welcome again, everyone. Um, today we are going to talk about nutrition and feeding the bees. Like all animals, um, bees um, need uh, source of uh, hydrocarbides and proteins and also the water. Um, the carbohydrates usually come in the forms of um, some sort of sugar, uh, usually from plants in the form of a nectar that they secrete to attract the pollinators. Um, in our case, bees, but uh, there are other pollinators as well. The uh, nectar is usually a solution of uh, sucrose and water but depends on the plants. Some of the plants may secrete uh, the, the uh, larger proportion of fructose or glucose in the nectar, uh, but bees themselves prefer sucrose on its own with uh, the water. The concentration is usually about between 10 and about 40%. Um, the source of protein comes from the pollen uh, in plants, and the pollen contains all the other essential nutrients that the animal requires, uh, not just the protein, but also the vitamin and very important fats. And of course, they need the water as well. We'll talk about these three components in the detail in a moment. Next slide, please. So, um, Bees need um, these three components um, 
to in order to feed the larvae and also the older foraging bees. The old bees uh, need to be fed work with jelly from the middle-aged adult bees um, because they cannot feed themselves and they haven't got enough of uh, fat bodies in their body to sustain themselves. So they need to be fed uh, raw jelly or, or work with jelly uh, excreted by the middle-aged house bees. They also need to feed larvae, of course, but the proportion of the different sugars and proteins in the young larvae jelly is different to the adult bees. So um, they they need um, this um, good source of uh, nourishment uh, uh, during the development and expansion of the colony, and um, they need to feed the young developing larvae. They need to feed the queen because the queen, if she is not fed, obviously she cannot lay because um, the ability to produce eggs is crucially dependent on the amount of food she is fed. So if there is an income in the colony, then uh, if there is an income in nectar uh, and, and proteins in phone call, and then the bees will feed the queen and she will lay. Without this income, um, the bees will not feed her and she will not lay. Um, it's important that uh, the colony has good income uh, so that they can supply a large amount of uh, worker jelly to the young developing bees. You can see in these two slides the difference between the colony which is uh, enjoying a, a good income in a, a good part of the season as against the right hand side picture where the larvae were quite undernourished. And this lack of nourishment has a, a very serious consequences for the uh, lifespan and other aspects of the uh, eventual development of the bees later on in their life. So the poor nutrition in an uh, adverse part of the season, perhaps uh, um, at the uh, end of the dry season here, uh, will have a consequences for the wool colony. The undernourished young larvae will develop into a much smaller workers which will be less able to um, forage they will be uh, shorter lived they'll be more prone to diseases and so on we seem to have lost the share just reshare it I think we have dealt with also next one, next slide. It's, it's rather surprising how much uh, income average colony needs during the season. Um, depends on sources and depends on the climatic conditions. Um, these figures of about 100 pounds or 50 kilograms of uh, honey, not uh, nectar, honey, applies to the northern Europe. I think in more warmer climates like here, the figures are actually much higher. Um, it will not be surprising if uh, the colony, average colony in subtropical or tropical parts of the world requires up to twice as much of the income, annual income, than it is in the northern part of the Europe that they are from. Yeah, that's a good point because um, our bees have a, a different, a slight, they a longer, a longer si they cycle. Do. So they do need uh, quite a bit more, at least twice as much more of the income to the northern European bees do. Yes. So uh, the figures you see on the slide now apply to the northern Europe, but uh, your situation, you would have to minimum double, and I would say even treble yes. the amount of uh, all these uh, components of the bee diet. Yep. Now, in, in, in Europe, we have a, a part of the season when the bees cannot forage because it's too cold, it's frosty and all that. 
And um, so uh, we have to feed bees before this uh, winter season comes. But this sort of problem applies to uh, tropical countries as well, because although you haven't got uh, winter season like we have, we have a dry and wet season. And in the wet season, the similar situation occurs. You have a, a dearth of income. Uh, the bees are unable to get much from outside. So I think uh, the subtropical and tropical beekeepers should consider helping their bees by feeding them prior to this uh, unpleasant or un unfriendly season coming up. So before the uh, rainy season starts, uh, beekeepers should consider helping their bees by feeding them both hydrocarbons, that means sugar syrup, and some form of protein. Either pollen they saved from collecting it before when there was a time of plenty, or consider buying a pollen substitute. Any particular type of pollen substitute? Well, I would suggest try to steer clear from soya-based substitutes. They are cheaper, but soya has a, a lot of anti-nutrients. So if you can get uh, uh, non-soya-based uh, pollen substitutes, such as Feed Bee or Ultra Bee or Mega Bee, all these three are based on a garden peas, and those are much less uh, unpleasant or unfriendly to the bees than the cheaper soya-based uh, substitute. They also have the required uh, proportion of all the essential amino acids, where some pollens don't. And they also have uh, the required vitamins and fats, which is very important. So it's a complete replacement food, very important for the development of the colony, which is going to survive the um, unfriendly part of the year you know in here it will be the rain season in northern europe it will be the winter season right so let's look at these three components uh, in, in a little bit more detail um the nectar is a source of hydrocarbons it's a solution of sugar or sugars in water um, and the bees uh, will collect it uh, from the flowers or in some parts from honey juice and will concentrate it into a into a honey and store it in the cells um, the honeydew is not particularly good uh, part of the or, or not good source of the hydrocarbons because uh, it contains uh, sugars which are toxic or undigestible to bees and um, so the honeydew would be best removed and consume, consumed by us rather than to be left for the colony to survive the quiet season. It's a good question. Um, I, because the honeydews, there's a lot of periods in time, I know in Trinidad, where there's a, an abundance of honeydew. Yeah. And the bees will pack that into the hives. Yeah. Um, it would be best to take the honeydew out uh, use it for our own human consumption and replace it uh, for the bees' consumption with uh, syrup, with uh, white sugar syrup. The white sugar syrup is actually better food for them than the honey use because the honey use may contain, they often do, um, loads of minerals. Uh, we'll talk about the honey in a moment. And uh, the minerals are indigestible to bees, so they produce uh, lots of waste product and they more importantly contain uh, many sugars which are toxic to bees so they cause dysentery and uh, other health problems so, so the honey use although they are uh, appreciated by some people for their very strong and unique taste for the bees they are not particularly good right so what happens to the nectar when the bees collect it and take it home uh, during the flight from the from the source of the nectar from the flowers to the hive they inject uh, some enzymes and these enzymes split the sucrose which is the normal sugar in most nectars into its simple components into the fructose and glucose and uh, when they arrive home they pass this nectar from the honey crop to the receiving bees that will further concentrate the uh, nectar into a honey and store it in the cells. 
So back again to the honey use, which we were talking uh, just a moment ago, um, you need the honey use are uh, uh, sugar substances which are normally produced by sub sucking insects, things like aphids and uh, leaf hoppers and white flies and so on. Um, these insects, uh, some or they 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 tap into the uh, plant to take the uh, sap, and they use the protein for their own use for building up their own bodies, and they use the or they excrete the uh, excessive sugars which they cannot use, uh, and and the bees will collect these droplets of uh, sugar solutions and they bring it home uh, in the form of uh, honey. Yield. So what type of uh, hydrocarbons can we feed? Um, well, we can feed honey, which was saved from the previous uh, uh, food season, but it is not advised because the honey can be a source of disease. Uh, if the honey is old or subjected to high temperature, like in tropics, uh, it may, uh, there may be a, a high development of a uh, substance called uh, methyl Hydrofluoral, which is toxic to bees. Um, so feeding old or previously saved honey is not generally recommended. There are circumstances you, you may have to feed it, for example, to swarms, if, uh, if you capture all, or some bees which you have collected from uh, undesirable places. But generally speaking, uh, we try to avoid. So you can feed. Uh, also, um feeding your bees back honey gives the not the effect that you want sometimes well, you can either get robin this is it this is absolutely true that uh, it will excite the bees and uh, so the bees will be very excited by this new source of income and they'll be flying about the other bees in the apiary will sense that and uh, so can instigate robbing so it's 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 not desirable yeah so um, and, and um, one last i think as well it doesn't give you the result that you're looking for no. so if, if you're looking to for brood development don't feed your bees honey don't because it's yeah. uh, you, uh, it, it's too concentrated if you are looking to stimulate the development of the nest uh, it's much better to feed them uh, sugar syrup which is similar in its strength to the naturally occurring uh, sources of nectar, so uh, I would say something like one to one uh, strength or even less would be better than giving them uh, honey, which is uh, much too concentrated and doesn't doesn't actually stimulate um, the, the colony into a, a build up into an expansion. So feeding the sugar is much more preferable. In our winter climes, we all, we cannot feed sugar syrup in during the winter season because the bees cannot process it so uh, we feed uh, solid sugars but uh, solid sugars actually uh, solid sugars wouldn't actually do any harm um, if you fed them just before the rainy season the it would it, it would prevent the colony from starving but it doesn't uh, stimulate the colony into expansion because you probably do not want to expand the colony uh, just at the start of rainy season because there is no income so you can feed solid sugar uh, when I say solid sugar, either as it comes in the form of a, a dry crystal sugar, or you can make a, a solid sugar cake. Um, the sugar that you should feed them should be really just white sugar rather than uh, brown or, or sugar with molasses, because the molasses contain uh, some other sugars which are toxic to bees. So it's much better to get white sugar. You can also buy uh, ready-made syrups, uh, things like high uh, fructose corn syrup or high fructose syrup. Um, these are much more expensive in Europe, but I think here they are cheaper than um, they are in Europe. You can feed those, but be careful how they are made. They are made by hydrolyzing starch and sometimes uh, acid residues are left in it, and the acid residues can be harmful to bees. Um, if you make the... Um, okay. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
how do you how do you feed the um, sugar syrup? Well, there, there are different feeders available. Again, this is something which is um, more attuned to the European conditions than Caribbean because we probably are more influenced by the way things are done in the United States and Mexico and Canada, maybe. Um, we don't generally use bottles for feeding. Uh, we have tray feeders, uh, widely available. Uh, I think they're available here as well. Or you can use contact feeders, which is essentially a bucket with a mesh uh, welded into the lid of the bucket, or frame feeders. Um, I think frame feeders would be quite popular here because you mostly use Langstroff and the supply of the frame feeders are quite easy from the United States. Yeah. So that probably is the most common uh, type of a feeder here. If you do use frame feeders, make sure that there are the ladders or, or socks to prevent the bees from drowning. Um, back again to the solid sugars feeding. Um, I don't know if you are doing much of a solid sugar feeding here, but uh, it is something which is widely practiced in Australia, for example, with similar climate to here. Um, they don't do syrup much before the uh, rainy season because they do not want to uh, stimulate the colony into expansion just before the quiet time. So they would fill the uh, a pocket or the frame feeder with ordinary white uh, crystal sugar as is and don't give them anything else. And it's sufficient to prevent the starvation because the bees will need it uh, or they will eat it if they need it, but it doesn't stimulate uh, expansion. Oh, go ahead. They can yeah, eat. and um, so it's a quite a popular way of feeding the bees, both in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and in the United States. In Europe, where I come from, it is not popular at all. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm so propagating it to, to consider using this sort of thing in the middle of our winter. So, about it, folks, we just dropped offline for a second, um, but we're reassuring the presentation. So that was the sugars which most people will be quite familiar with and with feeding uh, the carbohydrates. Now we come to the protein, which is, in my view, even more important aspect of the bee diet. And very few people consider uh, the importance of the protein for the bee's development. The bees cannot develop without the protein. However much sugar you, you give them, unless they have a source of protein, they will not expand, they will not develop. So they need a source of protein. And in this case, it is usually a protein. Uh, sorry, it is usually a pollen. Um, the pollens, um, they come from various uh, different sources. And it's important for the colony for them to come from as wide variety of flowers as it is possible, because not all pollens are the same. Um, it's important from the bees' uh, point of view for the pollen to have a, a minimum amount of uh, crude protein available. And many studies have shown that uh, the minimum crude protein available to pollen should be in a region of 20% or more. Uh, you'll be surprised to learn that many plants don't have that, that the crude pollen content can be as low as 10, 12%. In, in plants that are quite familiar to you, which you have seen bees working on. Things like, for example, maize or sunflowers. They are very, very poor in the amount of uh, total protein they contain. And also, uh, the, the protein needs to have uh, all the essential amino acids. And many of these pollens don't have that. Um, this slide just shows you uh, how Poor some of these pollens from quite common plants, which some of them will be familiar to you. Ha! Uh, huh, you know, that, um, for example, you'll be all familiar with sunflowers or the Asteraceae family of flowers. They are common everywhere all around the world. And they are all very poor. And further, not only poor in, pollen, in, in protein content, but in the composition of the amino acids. And so is maize. Bees will work maize quite quite well and quite willingly, but the maize actually is a, quite a bit of a junk food for the bees. Yeah, we were 
we were discussing that yesterday yes. and, and this morning, uh, and it's it's one of the things that um, we need to reach out to we've got our universities um, within the region to help us do some research in that regards to, to do an analysis of some of the pollens that we believe our bees are feeding on and what is the crude protein content. And, and I think you need a two-pronged approach to that. You need to investigate uh, the sources of your pollen to identify which source the pollen comes from. So that's one approach. Yes. And the second approach is then to analyze the composition of the each pollen. What is the crude protein, protein content and what is the composition of the essential amino acids too? Because this it's is just three. as important. Yes, so it's three. So, so it's three. three. Yes, yes, yes. So, so this is something that uh, money should be really spent on, if possible. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Those plants, many of them are again from temperate climate rather than, rather than tropical climate. So you would have to do your own uh, work on this sort of thing. But ma many things are in common. Maize grows here. Uh, sunflower uh, type of uh, flowers will grow here, so, so uh, that is quite important to, to bear in mind. So, uh, because the pollens are not the same, um, usually when the colony has access to a large variety of plants, uh, the deficiencies in each individual source it can be uh, compensated by uh, having the source from another plant. So, generally speaking, in the normal circumstances, the colony will do quite well. But um, if you have a situation where uh, there is a predominantly just one source of uh, pollen, um, you have to be careful whether that source is quite good. Uh, I have been told yesterday that um, people who keep uh, bees here close to the uh, cocoa uh, coconut uh, palms, their bees are doing very well because it appears that the uh, coconut palm pollen is quite good. I do not know anything about it, so I cannot comment on it. But um, again, you need to have the knowledge which is the good and which is the bad and which is the indifferent. Yes, definitely. So on that slide, you have uh, pictures of uh, uh, some of the uh, junk food type of a pollen. Uh, the sunflower types. Uh, I don't know if you grow any blueberries or cranberries or anything like that, but again, those are very, very poor. Um, buckwheat, which is a plant quite commonly grown in India and uh, Australia, not so much in uh, Europe, except for Asiatic part of the Soviet Union or Russia. Um, but um, so those are very, very poor. The, the good ones are. Fruit trees, normally they are quite good. And um, I don't know if you have willows here, probably not much. Uh, bananas, I'm not sure if they are any good well, for... Bananas, they would cut the flower. Oh, I see. Okay. It would be good if they left the flower, but they, left it. they okay. cut the flower oh, I see. Um, to slow down the ripening process. Oh, I see. Okay. So maybe the planting, you probably get in the plants, the planting. Yes, yes. So again, something which you need to uh, investigate uh, for the local conditions, really. Some plants have a relatively poor uh, protein content, but they have a, a large amount of fat. And the bees find this uh, fat content very attractive because they need the fats and they can't synthesize it like we can. Um, so although the quality of pollen is poor because th there is a large amount of fat in it, the bees will collect it uh, very willingly. And uh, there was an example of uh, dandelion. I don't know if you have a dandelion here. Uh, it's, they have a type of type. Yeah, yeah. So, so they they uh, not very good for the bees, but uh, they'll collect it because of the fat content. Now, on this slide, you can see two columns of the 10 essential amino acids that uh, the bees require. And can we go back again to the sure. same one? And if you look at the left-hand column, you have uh, uh, smaller figures of the all 10 of the amino acids. And in the right-hand column, it's the higher figures. The smaller or the, the lower figure in the left-hand column indicates the minimum requirement of um, this different composition in the, the available protein 
and the right hand uh, column in the brackets shows the optimum uh, composition of these different uh, essential amino acids that the bees need to obtain from their food like us they are no different to us we also need these 10 essential amino acids so uh, as I say, we have to uh, reinforce the need to find, uh, or you, you need to find the, the composition of your own pollen. Um, just because you are in tropics, it doesn't mean that all the pollens are good. Uh, I, I come across a number of other countries where the quality of pollen was very good. Next one. Okay, so um, another uh, essential component of uh, the pollen uh, is, are the vitamins. Uh, bees, like all other animals, uh, need a diet which is quite rich in the vitamin content, and they need roughly the same sort of vitamins that we do. Uh, there is one exception that um, many of the vitamins from the B group are usually made for the bees in their gut by the friendly bacteria in, in the uh, biogenome. Uh, they normally get the B uh, vitamins from the diet, uh, from the gut, but the rest of them have to be supplied from the diet. So um, certainly the bees which are secreting the worker jelly and the raw jelly need a, a diet which is very rich in vitamins. Some of the old vitamins as stored in bee bread, for example, uh, tend to go much down on the vitamin content. So the old pollen, even if it is not uh, uh, spoiled by decomposition, uh, is not as good source of vitamins as fresh pollen or pollen supplied as a vitamin supplement. So it's something which uh, you might need to consider at the start of the active bee season, perhaps from now until middle of January, I think when the flow season starts here, um, essential for them to have a diet rich in vitamins. Um, bees store some of the food in, in, in comb, but also in the form of a fat bodies within their bodies. So, um, the bees which are uh, being nursed just prior to the quiet season are usually um, supplied with much more food rich in um, both fats and uh, uh, other essential components of the uh, diet so that they get uh, a, a lot more of fat bodies as a young juvenile bees so they are able then, in the time of death, to, to secrete the work and royal jelly within, from within their own bodies, from the fat bodies which are contained in the abdomen. Um, how can you get these sources of uh, protein if, if, if uh, your season is poor or if it is uh, in the wrong time? Well, you can, you can uh, chop naturally occurring pollen. I don't know if this practice is done here, but we do do it in Europe. Um, there are two basic types of uh, pollen traps. One fits underneath the hive, which I think it's probably better uh, because it uh, prevents uh, spoilage by rain. The other one hangs on the front of the hive. And then if you collect these pollens, you can freeze them to preserve them. And when you need to feed them to the colony prior to expansion at the end of the rain, rainy season, like now, you simply sprinkle this uh, frozen pollen onto a flat drawn comb, tap it gently, and uh, give it back to the bees. And the bees will ram it in with their heads. With their heads, they ram it into the cells and use it directly. Just able to find some 
nutritional information on coconut pollen. Okay. So calories 283, protein 3 grams, carbs 10 grams, fat 27, sugars 5 grams, fiber. And show us the... Well, that's interesting. Um, it obviously doesn't give you the breakdown of uh, the, the essential yeah, amino acids. It would uh, be interesting to get yeah. that. Yeah, I'll find that, that, that was per 100 grams, or? I would assume, yeah. Per yeah, per 100 grams. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Um, can we yeah, go back a little back, bit? Go back. So, yeah. Okay, that, that, that's the one. So, um, this is the one source of protein you can uh, supplement your bees at the start of the active season. I would say now, because uh, you, your your Active season starts probably in one month time, I would guess. So you need to, or you would help your bees if they were able to expand. So you get a, a larger workforce to exploit the honey flow or nectar flow when it starts in about three weeks time, maybe four weeks time from now. And the other source of protein would be the pollen substitutes <clears throat> we're talking about. Um, I would suggest try one of the three, uh, they're all made in North America, one of the three uh, non-soya-based pollen substitute uh, makes. Uh, Feed B is Canadian product. Most research, and uh, in my view, probably the best. There is American copy of it, uh, made by Man Lake. Um, called Ultra B. The vitamin content is not as widely advertised what it is, and they say that it's uh, good enough, but it's not so easy to find actually breakdown. And the third one is the Mega B. Of the three, I think the Canadian product is probably the best if you can get it. Okay. Good one. Um, why I'm not happy about the soya? Well, the soya. Um, is actually harmful to all animals, not just to bees. And the manufacturers are trying very hard to remove this uh, anti-nutrients from it, but uh, it's almost impossible to remove quite all of them. The soya inhibits uh, uh, some of the enzymes that we need to digest the food. And if you, for example, look at the um, population in Southeast Asia, where the soya is uh, very commonly used in the food diet, they are all in small in statues and uh, relatively small compared with the uh, population in Europe or in Africa in North America, where soya is not eaten as such. Soya is given to animals as a source of protein, but those animals usually get killed and eaten before this uh, harmful effects of soya are shown. But it has same detrimental effects on bees as well. So if you can, try to obtain the... Uh, Pollen substitute, which are not based on soya. Um, one of the things that I found uh, two years ago when I came to another island was that people had access to the pollen substitute. They tried to feed it the way it was suggested on the suck of this um, product, and the bees didn't take it. So um, um, we actually show them the easiest way of doing it. And the easiest way is to mix initially to get a strong sugar syrup, two to one. By that I mean two kilograms of sugar to one liter of water. And then add to it about three kilograms of um, the pollen substitute and mix it. So you get a, a, a thickish paste, a bit like a mustard or maybe ketchup type of a co uh, uh, consistency. And we normally load it into a, what we call mortar gun, but you can use piping bag for, you know, like for decorating the cakes or just ordinary plastic bag and snip a corner off and just pipe it on top of the bars, uh, as you see on the picture. We have done it in a, a association apiary uh, people were very doubtful because they tried it and the bees didn't want to take it. And when we done it this way, the, the members were absolutely astonished how quickly and how willingly the bees were taking it because they were out of 
point of starvation and it was end of the rainy season so there was no source of any income and when we offered them this pollen substitute they couldn't get enough of it and uh, the bees calmed down and uh, and we had to go home after about a week or so but uh, we read reports that they never had such a good uh, crop and uh, such a good bees uh, since we fed them they never had them before like that and it's only because we fed them quite generously with uh, the protein as well as with sugar syrup. So they were in much better shape to exploit the nectar flow when it came. Okay, the next slide. Can I wrap up? Yeah. Uh, well, this is actually not so much relevant to you because uh, your seasons are different. Um, I would say the best time to feed the bees with uh, the proteins is at the start of the active season, so I would say now. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, the next slide, or you can wrap it up if you want. Uh, let's see the next slide. Um, well, this is uh, something to warn that if you feed just um, sugar syrup, you may actually make the situation a little bit worse because uh, that will stimulate the queen into laying. But if there is no uh, income of uh, protein, uh, the, the queen will lay. But if the bees don't have a source of protein income, they will initially uh, synthesize or secrete the work with jelly from their own bodies, from the stores of vitality jelly they have in their own bodies, from their own fat bodies. But once that is ex exhausted after about a week, um, they'll start to cannibalize their brood they, they have raised because there is no other source of protein. So uh, it's no good feeding bees just the sugar syrup without feeding the protein as well. Yep. Now the last uh, segment of the honeybee diet is water. Plenty of water today and uh, in the rainy season, but during the dry season, the situation may be quite different. And the bee, bees need uh, quite a large amount of uh, water to cool the hive down if the temperatures are higher than uh, about 35 degrees and they also need the water to create humidity so that um, the eggs which need a certain amount of humidity which is in the range of about 80 percent is created and so that they, they can hatch and they can develop as a larvae so the source of water in the dry season is exceptionally important that's a lot i think Yep, okay. Um, well, thank you, Rudy. There was a list of reading, but I guess it's not... Uh, yeah, we can, we can always share that. We're having some internet issues here. We've been in and out of our session twice, or three times. And we seem to also be lost power as well. <laughs> so it's all fun and games here. <laughs> Uh, anybody have any questions um, before we wrap up? This yeah, Rich. Yeah, man, I, I have a, I have some complex well issues in my head are a little complex. I, I hope you and Rudy could help me sort it out. All right, go ahead. For it. Go, go, go for it. All right. So the, the, the context, I'm just rolling back a little bit. We, we, we know about adaption. We, we mining, we rearing European bees, bees that uh evolved um with spring summer autumn winter um, in an environment where we have two seasons right our the bees don't die they adapt somehow that's one that's one layer another layer in beekeeping is the economic factor whether you are commercial whether you're hobbyist you have cost considerations, right? Depending on your position. And in that context, I'm concerned with the direction of Caribbean beekeeping. Um, I recognize that we live in a sort of global community, a global village really, and that we can access products from, from all over. But I am biased heavily towards um, the environment in which in which the bees reside. And the, the issues related to feeding, 
Um, you mentioned, Rudy, uh, the white sugar versus the brown sugar issue. Um, and possibly yeah. high fructose corn syrup yeah, I stop, I stop, I stop. as a substitute. You, you, you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Right, cool. There is some disturbance, but we can hear you. All right, cool. Me. Yeah. Um, and now even with, with pollen, and me understand the natural environment, not all species provide the same nutritional value. So then we're looking at import a pollen substitute and so on. So while we're trying to evolve Caribbean economies and, and so on, we, we're still in this global space. And it seems as though we already import maybe 90%, maybe 100% of foundation. We perhaps sufficient or efficient in some level of um, making hive boxes, but we still import frames and wire and all these sort of things. How do we evolve a Caribbean beekeeping um, with some regional sustainability in a context where Richmond. we've been told, and I'm, I'm questioning some of the literature that we should use white sugar versus brown sugar it's coming and going still um well same thing as that yes that that possibly we should now give consideration to even um looking at high fructose corn syrup which we don't produce here at all you know and because then we're not sure of the viability of our pollen then perhaps we should consider important pollen supplements or substitutes well i would never i would never import pollen because you do not know how good the pollen is exactly you do not know the uh, health of the pollen whether it comes from disease colonies or not so pollen i would never import not, not the pollen China, substitute pollen substitute is a different matter it has never been in contact with bees, so there is no danger of any of uh, diseases being spread by feeding the pollen substitute. Yeah, but you mentioned soya, and, and we, we, we now have to become adept at figuring out the compositions. And if, this, if that is what we have to do, then that is what we have to do. Um, I, I, would, I would try not to is encourage it, is there not the either. Huh? Well, you, you, you have the option of importing the stuff, which is good. You know, I'm sure that you have a, access to Man Lake uh, who are trying to push a ultra B at anyone who is willing to buy it. But uh, why How not, do we uh, evolve a Caribbean beekeeping sector if we if we moving into arena where we, we import in every, everything? You know, yeah, because we haven't yeah, done the science to figure out what is what is yeah, good exactly. and how we should use what we have i'm saying we need to have that kind of discussion rather than initially bringing in high fructose corn syrup bringing in pollen substitute we already bringing in everything we could as well bring in the honey and sell it well i mean well, that is, that is a little but we're sustaining if, if a mean, beekeeping industry with yeah. with 80 90 percent imports and that is a concern yeah, but, I have, a, a policy principle con concern. Yeah, but Gladstone, um, let, let's look at it in this perspective. If you haven't, we, we've already identified A, we haven't done the research as to what, what what's the best, what's the best protein sources or pollen sources for our bees to go after. It, the information doesn't exist in the Caribbean. All right. Two, we haven't identified the sources. Three, we haven't identified if they've got all the right amino acids that are required. I right, so there's a, some science that needs to go down for us to for us to drill down and and and, and get the information on. Agreed. Um, one of the things that is is blatantly obvious, um, and it doesn't matter. You have traveled through the Caribbean and met beekeepers. I have traveled through the Caribbean and met beekeepers. I, we're all struggling to provide for our be seeing beekeepers struggling to provide for their bee for their bees in periods of dearth. Um, 
whether or not these these struggles are of uh, could have been avoided um we 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 we, we don't we, obviously yes they can and the easiest way to avoid these struggles is by feeding your fe feeding your bees um you can't get to a point of feeding your bees or maybe they, we could find once we find what protein sources are good for the bees then we can create the abundance then we can um start harvesting pollen and repackaging it for your encouraging beekeepers to repackage it for the bees and provide it to them on, uh, during the dearth period but until we do the science we have to do what we can to maintain our bees while we can until there's a better solution um yeah everything is about importation and i can see your i can see a standpoint with regards to importation and the cost of goods and so forth but it's the reality is the reality all right if we're, if we're if we're not producing our, our own sugar, where does sugar could come from? Is, you, is, still is, make, is, you still go sugar cane? Yeah. You, you still go sugar cane and tobacco, my brother? Listen, listen. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah, my point. Uh, going back to the premise that the bees were relocated to the region. Yes, right. They're not and, and, species. And all species adapt and adjust. So it's like our coconut oil, but don't even want to go there. Which We've been using for centuries, then it became a bad thing, and now it's back to a good thing. You know? Um, so no brown sugar. Brown sugar, brown sugar is a source of, of, of calcium. I mean, I, I, I haven't done the research, nor am I aware of it. But has have those studies been done within the context? I've been using brown sugar. For this season, I've been using brown sugar. And all this talk, I'm putting it this way based on my experience of the century and, and maybe stuff are happening in the bees that I don't know. I'm prepared to admit that. But I'm saying that we seem to be saying up front, don't use this, it's not good. Let's bring in something. And that becomes no, not. I disagree. Um, I know that you yourself. I know. I know that you yourself collect pollen, and you feed your bees with your own pollen when they need it. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good. But how many people do that? Yeah, you are the only not, one. Why not us? Why not tell them that? And I'm not being critical or anything. I'm just saying it seems to be a, a sort of philosophy a sort of mindset and i'm seeing it among young beekeepers everybody not everybody that is an exaggeration but into some pollen substitute import you know they into some kind of and i know it's a global village but aren't we supposed to be building some kind of sustainability uh in this uh, sector is that not a desire a struggle as opposed to yes. going back to so Gladstone, let's make our own pollen patty. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from finding a protein source that is readily available locally, which is not going to affect your bees, and cool. we create and you create your own protein patty. When nobody's saying don't do this, we're just giving you options along the on on the journey. So if you're on a journey and you need the you need, you see your bees are deficient. Okay, so let's look at this. I'm a beekeeper. I go in my hive. I see there's the queen is not laying. I see very few, I see some honey stores or nectar, st nectar stores. I don't see any pollen. So she's not going to lay actively. So there's a, a pollen deficiency in the hive. How do I correct that? What's, what are the options for me to correct that now? Do I correct yeah. that via um, my going, my going and find solo as a solo man? Maybe you need to look at the location. Pollen. I buy some pollen and 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 let me and and let me make my own pollen patty. Will will solo have enough pollen patty to give me? I don't know. Or is it something I can buy this year? Pull back and, and look then, at your location. I, I, yeah. So let's look at the location. Okay. So let's yeah. look at us changing our location. At the population density. And and there's exactly there's so many things that we can look at. But what do we do to solve the problem? Because well, if I'm there's, saying, I, I'm, I'm, not saying, you know. I'm saying yeah. when we say and the prevailing, not just here, not here, generally, this is just from my feedback and interaction with beekeepers. You're right. hearing a lot of talk now. 
it's like the buzz thing import pollen substitute or supplement or, or whatever but people getting into that in a mass way and i'm saying yeah but we evolved in something here we you know we're not mining european bees in the caribbean our bees have some functionality they could adjust and adapt we read stuff and we you know it's it's a little disconcerting just in terms of the if i could call it an east-west philosophy a beekeeping you know depending on what school you subscribe to then it Many beekeepers say they have no qualms with bringing in everything for the beekeeping, you know, every single item. And I'm saying, hey, yeah, we can do that, you know, but bees relate with the environment. They interact with the environment. So, so could we not try and capitalize on that innate quality of the bee itself in terms of how we evolve the industry? All right. Sorry, I was on a little soapbox there, but I'm... Um... No, Gladstone, Gladstone, I, I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you. But my point is, is that we have to re re realize where we are. And we're in a... And if, and I mean, if we really want to talk about where we are, us as people in these islands are not endemic to these islands at all. We shouldn't even be here. So I mean, if we want to go, if we want to go right back, we evolved right, right here, man. Let's say coexist. Yeah, we have, but we have also just we have evolved right here. Evolved we have evolved right here, and yet we are still importing food for us to eat. So let's All not right, go so, back to yeah, that. So, so here, what, what do we, what do you say to that one? Let's cut down on the population of people. No, and, no, no. Let let me keep the set the because example we because we work with a life form that has a great affinity. But what happens out of our house with the natural environment? But, but Gladstone, you something. have the ultimate ability as human as a human being to evolve in your space. And you as an individual time, are still importing stuff from other countries. So you need to stop importing stuff yourself. If, I, I, yeah, because it's but I'm the raising the point. Straight. So all right, so but I, we need I am to raise the point. I'm not saying I don't. I, I, I import foundation, you know, I buy local, I, I make foundation, I can't make enough, right? right. I make ah, so, you, you, so that means you need to have less bees. If you can't make enough foundation, no, you need no, to stop no. having I mean, too many I'm not, bees. I'm not personalizing it. I'm, I'm just raising uh -huh. a general discussion issue uh -huh. in terms uh -huh. of the direction of Caribbean beekeeping. I understand me in a global community. I'm not saying one is right and one is, is wrong or something. You know, I'm gonna, I'm, one, just... I'm gonna make one last suggestion and then I'm mm -hmm. going to uh I'm gonna let's come in segue across, kind of discussion. I'm gonna segue across to our teach our, our, our Argentinian friends. And All what right, I cool. would say is that we should use them as a model. Um uh the I can't even pronounce it. My Spanish is so bad. But the, 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 cap. Yeah. the CAP organization is a cooperative of beekeepers working cool. together to do their own research, to produce their own products, uh, to solve their own problems. So cool. the, the Ulan CAP is a creation of the cooperative to solve their problem. They've also got their own pollen patties, which they produce for themselves to solve their own protein problems. And that's right, what so I'm talking about. Fortunately, Argentina has economies of scales that have avoid, uh, allowed them that opportunity. What we need to do now as beekeepers, we probably need to say, okay, guys, we need to work more together closely in the, in, in the Caribbean, and we need to form our own regional cooperative which acbo is kind of like the um, general umbrella umbrella body and try to create critical mass so that we can produce our own products or cooperate with Ulan cap and uh, with cap and maybe they can help us to to produce our own products but it's the evolution that we need to we need to bring about the evolution that we need um yeah we have to create that evolution um, it's no point us saying uh, we're importing this from America, we're importing that from America. If we don't take action to create our own evolution, we're always going to be in the same place. So, and on that note, 
I'm gonna got you. I, I I'm gonna swing across. I see my friend Elan. Elan, I haven't seen you for a long time, my brother. How are you, man? Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Um, hey, nice you. Nice to see you. Yes, yes, yes. I, I what 20, 2019 tw or 2018? 2018 was the last time we saw each other. Very good. Okay. On that note, I'm going to. We have a little power a power issue, but we're gonna go ahead still. Um, I'm gonna allow my friends from Cap for them to take over the presentation. Uh, um, we I think there's only got a few slides, not as long as yesterday, because we want to wrap up by 11 11 15 today. Um, so what I will ask is that we're gonna focus on some of the app, the focus on the um, the the product and the efficacy um, and probably do some questions and answers um, on that regard. So I'm going to hand it over to Ellen and Mayor and you guys are in charge now. So thank you. You're, you need to unmute your microphone, unmute, you're muted. We are going to wait a few minutes uh, for me to join us. He's going to be the, the, oh. the lecturer. Hi, everyone. Ah, oh, we we're fine. Okay, so we could continue our discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes, no problem. Ah, a few minutes, ah, he will join yes. us. I, I think he just arrived. I just mm -hmm. admitted it. I think I just admitted it. It's my better check. What's the project this side? I hope I don't break anything. We still have a lot of work. Hi, how are you doing? Good, Richard. Okay, so, um, over to you, my friends. Um, can I start? Yes, you can start. Yes. yes. Okay. Do you see it? Well, are you seeing my my screen? Yes, we can see you. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Emilio Celarini from Argentina. Uh, for those who who don't know me, um, yesterday we have a a training, and uh, well, we we are going to. To continue today. Uh, thank you, Richard, uh, for the invitation. And um, well, the the idea for today is to talk uh, of Baroa and what is for for beekeeping, and provide you the the tools to work with this problem, especially using um, uh, the um, our product that is Alven Cap and organic acaricid. Um, uh, for those who don't uh, know us, we are uh, the CAP and our co-workers um, cooperative founded in 2012 um, from the union of a group of people from di different fields, but all linked to the beekeeping. Um, we all have the same goals uh, to, to achieve the self, uh, sustainability of beekeeping um, not only providing solutions to the production problems, but also helping um, producers to um, commercial development. So today we offer a series of products and uh, free help for and training for more than 250 beekeepers from our region. Um, well. 
Varroa uh, is the most um, destructive disease that uh, honeybees uh, are going through, and they uh, it caused uh, a lot of damage and economic costs. Um, this, uh, this is an external parasitic disease that uh, caused by Varroa destructor um, who attacks and feeds on honeybees. And well, recent study has shown that the mites feeds on the fatty bodies uh, from adult bees and the young bees. Uh, those fatty bodies are um, the main storage or sites of uh, nutrients, especially uh, nutrients uh, that are used for um, the human system. So uh, we have to understand that um, not the problem of barosis is it's in, uh, only from uh, the mites, uh, but uh, is the indirect damage that uh, it causes. Um, we can divide the damages in direct and uh, collateral or indirect damage. Um, first of all, the, the mites feeds on um, the bees, so um, uh, they um, extract a lot of nutrients and uh, it makes that uh, bees uh, born with a lower weight uh, so um, these um, no, uh, less nourished bees will bring uh, less uh, lifespan. Uh, also, uh, the immune, uh, immune system uh, is depressed and, uh, well, it causes uh, dead brood and birth will malformation. Um, all these uh, damages cause that um, the bees um, want to have uh, less uh, production. So um, uh, in addition to that, uh, direct damages um, are uh, collateral damages uh, that appears when uh, the colony uh, is weakened. And those are uh, lower honey production, um, the um, injuries that might cause uh, and that immune depression i told you um, increases uh, the susceptibility to um, another diseases especially uh, to viruses um, uh, also uh, the honey contamination with uh, synthetic acaricides so um, varroa together with the viruses. Oh, my. Sorry, uh, you can see uh, the, my, the presentation or is uh, on the first uh, page. You hear me? It's the first page. Now you can see? Yes, we can see. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It was uh, a hard problem here. Okay, so I was telling you uh, the damages that uh, Varrakos, and um, it's important to understand that uh, not only Varroa is the um, the problem, uh, but uh, the viruses with Varroa are uh, the trigger of the colony's collapse. So, um, in first step, uh, to, to understand uh, how to control it, we have to talk, talk a little bit about uh, the cycle. And we divide the Varroa cycle into, uh, first of all, the phoretic phase, that is the, um, uh, the stage dust uh, we generally is visible for us uh, when varroa is on the body of the adult bees, and then um, they uh, reproduce uh, on the brood cells. Um, a female uh, detects the cell that it's going to be sealed and penetrates on them, 
and start um, feeding uh, first with the larval food and then on the brood um, she has the um, she's able to lay male and female eggs and then uh, they're uh, rich um, uh, they can uh, reproduce and uh, only the the fertilized females uh, come out of the cell with the um, young bee. Um, Barua has a, a exponential behavior um, and has a preference for drone cells um, about uh, 1.6 uh, mites born from uh, worker cells uh, but the longer ovulation period that has the drone cells uh, allowed to um, more mites born. Um, that's why uh, they have preference for drone cells. To, to do a diagnosis of our high condition, um, we, we can do the jar test or the alcohol wash. Um, and the, the, this diagnose uh, should not begin with, uh, with the same symptoms, uh, but knowing the mite infestation. So this is done with a, with a white uh, mouse uh, jar and taking uh, the sampling uh, is the best tool to the beekeepers to know the, the condition. And we recommend to uh, collect uh, by, uh, around 300 or 400 at least uh, bees from uh, three frames uh, from the brood nest. This is very important uh, to not to make uh, mistakes uh, and um, at least uh, before and after performing a treatment. Uh, in this way, we will know if the treatment was uh, effective uh, or not. Um, um, the initial amount of mites um, is our treatment threshold and um, that's uh, the one who will determine uh, the effectiveness. Um, I want to emphasize the importance of uh, keeping the mites population as low as possible um, and well, we recommend to um, keep infestation rates uh, uh, of uh, in order of one percentage or low. Um, this uh, with these um, levels or loads of infestation, uh, we can uh, stay calm that uh, our hive uh, doesn't go into uh, that. Um, we 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 know that um, varroa reproduce in in cells, so um, it's very difficult to eradicate uh, the mites from our hives. Um, so uh, the important is to sampling, do the alcohol wash, and keep uh, the population as low as possible. To control varroa, we have. Um, no problem. Sorry. Um, do you see it on full screen or, or not? Yes. Uh, we see it as, um, yeah, we can see the screen. Yeah. Okay. So I want to present it in, uh, on the full screen. Wait a minute. Okay. Right. So, um, taking into account the those characteristics from the mites, um, we proceed to um, discuss how to control it uh, and what are the uh, available uh, possibilities. Uh, and um, I want to give you a series of practical tips. Um, the use of um, genetic uh, in bees uh, to that uh, can be resistant or tolerance to varroa is something that uh, is being studied in many countries 
but uh, until today there are no successful records um, that uh, of uh, that can be um, the solution. The use of um, the control through management is something that uh, can uh, reduce uh, the infestation at some point, but uh, does not attack the um, underlying problem, um, like putting drone frames uh, on hives at the moment uh, of higher levels of uh, reproduction. Um, so, because, well, uh, like I said, they prefer uh, drone cells. So um, we put um, drone frames and then we remove it. Um, but this is uh, not um, um, a technique that will um, decrease in a high level the, the mites. So uh, regarding the use of medicine control, um, there's organic and synthetic drugs. Um, synthetics are, are those who were used from the beginning when Varroa becomes a problem. And there are, in general, uh, neurotoxic uh, molecules like fluvalinate, uh, flumetrin, amitras, and kumafos are the most common synthetic drug used. Um, but they had a, a series of um, disadvantages. Um, for the bees, um, they decreased the average of lifespan beam. Um, they can um, short um, do the 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 queen to to atrophy their ovarioles and. Um, they wanna make that uh, the bees will replace her. Um, it can cause the population, and the most important is the uh, residues or the waste they they they, they had in the honey and wax, um, and also the, the problem with the resistance. Um, this problem is all um, always uh, happen and when uh, we uh, overdose or subdose, subdosing the those uh, synthetic drugs and um, so the resistance appears. To avoid this problem, um, organic drugs arise um, and the most common are uh, organic acids and essential oil, oils um, like oxalic acid, formic acid, the lactic acid and timol. And um, they are um, natural components of nectars, so um, they are not pollution polluting uh, substance uh, for the hive production. Um, also, they can be used in the organic production, and there is a low chance that Barroa the structure will develop. Um, can develop uh, resistance to them. So, um, oxalic acid is the active principle that we use uh, our product. Um, generally, um, oxalic acid is used uh, as a liquid or sublimation. Um, they have some disadvantages. Um, for example, the, the short residence time uh, and the toxicity level that uh, it has when it's sublimated. Um, they have a good efficacy, but um, they only act on theoretic mites. Uh, so the treatment to be really effective has to be um, repeat uh, over uh, four or five days uh, to kill the mites that are uh, being born. Um, so to avoid this uh, this point, our company designed uh, and released aluen cap, uh, which use oxalic acid in uh, slow release stri uh, strips of um, made of uh, a special cargo. Um, in this way, 
uh, in addition that is a an organic product um, you uh, once you you apply the treatment uh, it maintain active in the hive for at least uh, 42 days can, and can be more um, our the product benefits are that it's a, an organic product because it uses uh, oxalic acid that not generate uh, resistance and can be uh, used uh, in the honey in uh, any um, station station and it has a, a high uh, efficacy um, it's very easy to use once you put it uh, you can forget that um, the, pro the product is active and killing the, the mites that are born and um, it doesn't affect uh, and don't have the, um, the problems of the, it, it isn't harmful for, for bees uh, and the brood. Um, we, we have been developing um, a loan cap since uh, 2010 and, and we are in constant research uh, to continue improving and innovating to achieve uh, the more effective and easy way to apply uh, for beekeepers. Um, Alwen has been in Argentine market since uh, 2016, uh, yes, and today is sold in several uh, Latin American countries. Um, like uh, Chile, Uruguay, Peru, um, Bolivia, Dominican Republic, and Santa Lucia. Uh, Santa Lucia. Um, so we have test, tested in, in the five continents, and, and in some of them we have made uh, more than one, one test. So all this uh, data of this amount of tests um, allow us um, to um, measure it in uh, different environments, um, different uh, type of hives, and also uh, it's been it has been used in different um, kinds of bees like Af Africanized bees, um, and um, the advantages of the product is that uh, allow it to act and be effective um, in all uh, possible weathers. Um, so today we haven't had uh, any adverse report uh, regarding the, um, the weather. Like I said, uh, oxalic acid is a molecule that is uh, naturally presented in the, in the nectars. So, um, there is no established limit of the amount of oxalic acid allowed in, in honey. Um, um, the, um, when, when, we, when we do the, the studies, we've done one, um, we evaluate uh, the residual oxalic acid on bees, on wax, and in honey. And it was not found that the treatment has increased the levels that uh, already has uh, has naturally. Um, in this study, we can see that um, the amount of, of salic measured in honey was insignificant uh, in uh, hives treated with alum cap and and hives that uh, were not treated uh, with alum cap. There is no difference between uh, in the oxalic acid uh, concentration uh, in honey between uh, hives treated and not treated. So uh, it's important to, to you to know that um, uh, some countries uh, has uh, uh, oxalic acid like a uh, organic product and some countries not. Um, the alum cup uh, is presented in uh, packages of 60 strips and the application is very simple 
we remove the strip from the packages, uh, join the tips uh, and put it on uh, the brood nest, specifically on the, um, the frames three, five and seven. Um, it's important you, and I want to clarify that the principle of disper dispersion of aloem inside the hive is by contact. So the distribution of the strip is very, very important. Um, we have to um, insert them uh, on the on the brood. So when this brood uh, will born with Baroa, it will be in contact with the strips. Um, so it's very important that you too, uh, when you use it, to put it uh, like a like I explained in the and you can see in the in the graph. This is those strips are um, cellulose strips, and many people ask uh, uh, what happened uh, with them after uh, after the time. Uh, this study is from Mexico, where um, the contact area, as the strips, uh, were was were measured uh, by weighting the strips, and you can see that um, the the original weight uh, maintained uh, until uh, day 32, where they they had the 90 percentage of the original weight, meaning that uh, this treatment could be um, could have been followed and even more effective. Um, the dosification um, since Alwen was released. We recommend uh, those uh, was uh, four strips. Um, the systematic use uh, of this product in our country um, do that uh, the beekeepers um, reduce the number of strips per hive to three because they uh, said that they had good um, efficacy. So. Um, the the, uh, the hives uh, of of the keepers um, treated with, in this way uh, did not show an increase of uh, barra destructor low um, so uh, um, we observed too that uh, in most cases the keepers uh, didn't remove uh, the aluminum cap at uh, after the four two days, so um, two years ago we decided to carry out a series of dosing and permanent uh, tests. First one uh, comparing one, two, three, and four strips, and against a synthetic product, uh, Frumetrin. And the second one uh, we discard the treatment of one strip uh, due to the low efficacy. And it's because uh, uh, because um, the distribution, uh, like I said before, uh, the distribution in the hive is very important because uh, aluminum uh, act by contact. So uh, the conclusions uh, we we've made that is that aluminum remains effective beyond 42 days, and there is uh, no difference between using three or four strips. So nowadays we recommend the use of uh, three strips per hive and uh, on NAX uh, the use of two strips. Um, sorry, you can see that the efficacy was high and even more, more even higher than the synthetic product. Um, one of the measures that we take uh, on our efficacy trials uh, are the uh, the measure of the brew and bees variation. Um, many people think that uh, oxalic acid uh, is um, believe that it, yes it's uh, toxic for for bees, uh, but uh, aluminum cap. Uh, is in 
for the uh, how is formulated in in strips of low release and show that um, it's not harmful for uh, bees and roots. It depends on the uh, number of strips we use. Thus, here is another um, example of another trial. Um, this uh, were measure, we measured the, the variation number of bees. Uh, it was carried out in Argentina um, by comparing untreated hives, uh, hives treated with aloen, and uh, others uh, hives treated with uh, amitras. And we got the same conclusion that uh, aloen is not uh, harmful for, for bees. So um, when we recommend to apply the treatment, um, uh, like I said, uh, the, the organic um, product uh, allow us to use it uh, in any stage, um, but uh, we recommend to use it um, on spring before adding the super because we have no contamination of honey. Um, so uh, our hive will be protected uh, the month of uh, higher varroa reproduction when we have um, more brood. Then um, uh, here in Argentina, we have uh, winters, uh, so cold winters. So um, we recommend uh, to, apply, uh, to apply the treatment at the end of the season when uh, brood uh, uh, still uh, brood uh, to born, so uh, it allowed the, the the brood that will born uh, will be healthy to uh, survive the, the the cold winter and uh, start the the following season uh, with a high uh, population of bees. So uh, that's all for today. Uh, any question uh, that you have, uh, we hear you. And thank you. And sorry about uh, my language. Uh, English is not my native language. So if you don't understand something, please uh, tell me. Thank you. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. The, your English was very, very good. Um, <laughs> okay. We're having some technical difficulties on my end, so I cannot see anything. Oh, well, oh, I can see something. Okay. Um, yes, I can see the screen. Um, but I will not see anybody who has any questions to raise their hand. Um, but does anybody have any questions? Please feel free to ask. Oops. Any questions? Brother John, any questions? Any, any more questions or follow up to Ola and Cap? Um, not just a question for the presenter, but. Um, Hold on one second. I, I, I just wanted to ask the experienced beekeeper in Brother Dear, Rudy, based on the presentation. Yeah. Would he, Sorry, sorry about that, folks. So oh, sorry. Have a nice day. Um, this morning, my my concern has to do with a little of what I heard um, Brother Rudy said yesterday, and um, I basically has a question for him: whether he, whether he should have, or whether his experience in the world might would he use um, this Allen cap based on his situation with um, the oxalic acid? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> well can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my experience is that I have never, ever had problem with varroa mite. In all of my 35 years of uh, beekeeping, the varroa has never been a major issue for me. Um, however, I think it's very good to have a, another uh, weapon in our armory 
to fight it. I'm not saying that Varroa is uh, innocent. I think it does cause lots of problems, especially with uh, uh, introduction of viruses into the bees, which is more important than any other damage it may do. Um, not just uh, deformed wing virus, but other as well. So it is important to try to keep it down or to breed bees which are not only resistant to varroa, but effectively fight it. And there are strains of bees uh, developed all around the world which are able to do it. However, it's a good to have another weapon to fight it. Um, I personally do not like to use oxalic acid at all because of the issues with the human health. The oxalic acid is quite toxic to humans, and unless proper precautions are taken, uh, you mustn't handle the oxalic acid by naked hand because it's absorbed through the skin. You shouldn't breathe the vapors and so on. Um, and for that reason, I'm not 100% sure the claims that it doesn't get into the honey and all that. Um, I would like to see the studies first, whether any residues or any oxalic acid find its way into the honey. I would prefer not to have it in my diet. So that it, th th these are my comments about it. Um, I do not know what the situation will be in future in Europe, where I come from, whether the oxalic acid strips will be licensed to be used. Um, there might be issues, uh, some other treatments which seem to be more innocent, something like a hop guard, for example, have issues with licensing and uh, they are not able, not able to be used in Europe, where in America they are used quite routinely in some states, not all states. So, uh, to recap, it's good to have yet another weapon to fight the Varroa, but uh, whether we will be able to use it in Europe, I do not know. I personally would probably not use it because I don't feel the need for it. So that is my answer. I don't know if it's uh, any good. Uh, yeah, very helpful, very helpful. Thanks. I don't know if the presenters have any comment. Well, um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure whether the presenters have any comment about the issues with the human health by using these strips. Okay. Um, like I shown uh, in, in the graph uh, that um, we compare uh, hives treated with aluminum and hives not treated. Um, the, those uh, treated uh, doesn't um, um, have high uh, concentration of oxalic on honey. We have made um, studies uh, on in France at uh, it's up where they uh, have found that um, the um, th this uh, that doesn't alum doesn't increase the oxalic acids uh, concentration um, in honey and in wax. So, um, and there, there isn't uh, a limit uh, of permitted uh, quantity of concentration. Um, so we are in the, in the range and, and it's not toxic uh, to, to, to humans uh, at this concentration. It's different that when uh, we use it uh, sublimated, that as you said, it's very toxic for, for humans. We recommend uh, to when you use uh, aluminum, uh, the use of, glo of glob globs, globs uh, um, because can irritate uh, the skin, but uh, we use uh, without globs, it's no, no, no problem, no, no, not very toxic. Okay. Um, Sorry. Morning. Yes. So I hope somebody has a comment. Oh, Ilan. Right. Yeah. yeah. What um, to to make more strong? What uh, Emiliano tell? You can find uh, on on the web a uh, scientific research made by many uh, researchers from Argentina and other countries that has tied that so uh, that 
the level of acid oxalic is not uh, increased by alvin cap its nature from the nectars every nectar from plants has natural acid oxalic uh, in those levels so it's not a problem the other thing um, that you tell uh, I, I can't remember the, the name richard richmond i i think who who say is that it's okay. yeah uh, when it's common uh, in many places that the the bees has the the ability to uh, live with Baroa in the colonies like like in San Lucia or, or some uh, countries that can be but we have made uh, some experiments in, in countries like Bolivia that has a lot of uh, Africanized bees so they can live with Baroa it's not a a disease that uh, cause the the death of the bees but uh, in those experiments we uh, have seen that the hives that were treated with uh, alvin cap uh, the average of honey harvest is more because they not don't the bees does not need to uh, use energy to take their mites out or kill the the mites and those increase of honey harvest will be uh, is viable but uh, are around uh, 10 and 30 percent more of honey it depends of on many conditions uh, of the environment but in every environment that we uh, try that we uh, we found that that bees can live with varroa but when you, the bees are treated at the levels of varroa down goes down the average of honey harvest is more very good point Ilan um very good point um I I think from from my experience working using the the, the Elon cap product and using other products um as I said yesterday it's very important for us to take a scientific approach it's very important for us you as a beekeeper to monitor the the amount of varroa mite inside of your hive and to establish you know if they're beyond the threshold if you see your bees are struggling and you're not getting any honey and you're not treating you know you 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 have to look at your 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 methodology and see and and, and establish if you're doing something right or wrong um one of the things i will say working in the caribbean environment is that this is almost a perfect environment for varroa mite because they can continue to reproduce year round there is no the the brood the brood the the brood chamber or the the brood nest doesn't reduce significantly so there's no there's no slowdown or there's no pl point where okay if you knock back all the mites at a certain point the queen is gonna lay ease up it doesn't happen here we our queens are gonna continue laying virtually for the entire year um sometimes they'll be more prolific than others um but they're gonna lay up they're gonna lay quite they're gonna be producing quite regularly so we have to be mindful of um what what we do and what we don't do um, one of the things i can tell you is that i've we conducted a regional survey of beekeepers across the caribbean all right across the caribbean everybody recognizes varroa mite as a problem but how many of them are actually testing their bees for the presence of varroa mite probably less than three percent also there's everybody's cognizant that the varroa mite spreads a lot of diseases but how many of how many caribbean islands could tell you or beekeepers could tell you what diseases the bees are, are, are susceptible to? They don't know. 
so there is but what i can tell you from the data that i have seen of personally caribbean is that everybody's honey production is going down it's not there's there's nobody's honey production that is going up everybody's is going down now some people may blame it on the climate change which has a, a key part to do with it because the seasons are, are in flux um, and you have to your bees have to be ready to grab the nectar uh, when it cut when it's available if you're if it's not if your bees aren't ready you're gonna miss it but so you've got a, and and I've been to apiaries where guys I go to the apiary and I walk in and I, I was in different island up to the last six weeks um, I'm not gonna call any particular countries out but i was in places and i saw for a man are you treating nah man i i leave in the bees to do their own thing okay that's fine but they're not getting any honey and when i look at the statistics the, the, the for they have provided themselves the data keeps on going down and if I see, it I, I worries me and it concerns me when I can look at a survey form and a guy says, somebody can complete a survey and say they're getting honey, maybe one gallon per hive annually. <laughs> All right. No, I'm serious. I'm being serious. And it's a large proportion of beekeepers are getting one to three gallons of honey annually in the Caribbean. Right? And it's a number above 15%. So, it tells me either you've got some hive management issues on how you manage your beehives or there are other problems present that you're just not even addressing and i think it is very dangerous for persons to be new persons to be being brought into the industry without a full understanding of what they're dealing with and it's almost as if we are manifesting the problem even more and more and more and more and more. And what I am afraid of more than anything else, because bees are not endemic to the Caribbean, but my greatest fear is that the mites start interfering with other endemic species in the Caribbean. Um, I know that's happening in, in Europe with the bumblebee. The bumblebee, some of the diseases that are endemic that the, the, the mite spread have jumped across to the bumblebee. Now, if some of our indigenous species are already in danger from, you know, agricultural policies and um, environmental policies that really don't give a damn about their indigenous and the habitats. Um, but if we as beekeepers, uh, through our own choices, allow a pest to cross over into our indigenous species you know this is where you know i find that you know we, we we need to be mindful of what we're doing either we need to stop beekeeping period and let the bees just do their own thing and stop having managed colonies but if we are going to manage colonies we need to um manage them properly and look into every aspect of their health to ensure that they are healthy and one aspect of looking at your bees health is ensuring that you don't have intolerable intolerable levels of varroa mites um, and you are actively checking it rudy is actively checking for varroa mite in his colonies and he's finding that they are below, way below the threshold so he doesn't require to treat this is fine he saves himself money in 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 knowing that he doesn't need to treat because he's regularly checking but i'm sure if he saw that there was an occurrence he would take corrective action and what we are not doing in the Caribbean is we're not checking and we ain't taking correct any type of corrective action. And this is a problem. So education, um, learning to manage your bees properly and having, you know, making sure you got your easy mic check kit and, you know, or you do your sugar roll or whatever works for you. Alcohol, yeah. Alcohol yes. Wash. The alcohol wash, yeah, you know, it, is you sacrifice exactly you you sacrifice a few bees doing the alcohol wash that's what i use um but at the end of the day you get an accurate 
you get an accurate test and you know exactly where you are. So step one is to check your bees for the mite. That's step one. If your mite, if you don't have a mite problem, fine, move on. But regularly check. If you do find that you have a mite problem, you need to take some kind of corrective action. Be it fryer using um, traditional methodology, uh, doing a brood break, um, coupled with some kind of traditional treatment or you use some kind of mighty side to do the treatment but you must do something because Shopping all brood. yeah Shopping drone. yeah cutting out germ brood all, all these things you must but you know you might cut out germ brood as well as do a brood break for three or four days all right but you still got all the mites that are cutting the cap larvae that you will have to deal with at a later point in time so you know but as i said you have to be checking for your mite. If you're not checking for the mites, you know, you're just allowing more diseases, more pests to just multiply and you know, have a nice time. And then, you know. Good, good information, Richard. I, yeah, this one doesn't work. Yeah. Um, just press here. Yeah, you're on, you're on. Um, good information, Richard. Um, let, me, let me just see that. Um, my first encounter with Verona mite was in 1983. I was in Trinidad. That's why I started doing beekeeping. And uh, um, the beekeepers that I, I did beekeeping with, what they use, not a strip, but what they use is that they use tobacco, and the tobacco was placed in the smoker, and they smoked the hive with the, the, the tobacco. And what was really happening is that a sheet of newspaper was placed on, the, on top of the bottom board filled with grease. So when the Verona mite was, when the hive was smoked, the Verona mite would fall onto the newspaper and it would stick in the grease. They would pull out the grease and then burn it. That was what they did then. I am saying this just to say that when I came back to St. Lucia now, um, our more advanced beekeepers in terms of age, I was very young at the time, and when I told them, well, I, um, what Trinidad was doing, most of them or none of them took any advice as to what. And what really happened is that they lost almost 50%, close to 75% of what bees they had at the time. So Verona mite does rock havoc on the economy of, of bees if you don't take care of it. So having the treatment is very good. Um, the next thing is this, um, I heard that, um, oxalic acid, that's what is how ox, oxalic yeah. Yeah, acid is part of the nectar. So it appears that it is a natural thing, like my brothers from Argentina is saying, but on the other hand, when my brother here from Europe said it's not much of a problem for him, that was where the concern came up. I believe that, um, or not just believe, but one of my biggest concern is that with the information that is, I have been confronted with throughout the, um, the, the, um, the three days coming here, I was not aware of the pathogens like you mentioned. Now, if you have the mites and eventually there are pathogens, we know that it can be deadly whether to human beings if they consume whatever. So I believe it is something that we should really look into and try to curtail, because if there are pathogens, then at the end of the day, we need to be careful about that. Um, like Rudy, I um, have seen a few Verona mites, but I have never done anything like the alcohol or whatever test. So that might just be something that will have to be put into practice. Yeah. Yeah. Alcohol wash. Yeah. Alcohol wash is very nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Gaston. Go ahead, please. Yeah, brother Felix. Um, no, I just want to um, check in on John, me. John, John, John. With the Richmond Felix is just the the. Oh, the, all right. The, 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 the video, the video facilitator. But the I see, speaker I see. who was just speaking was John. Is John Edward? All right, brother John. I'm just checking on on the figure you update you quoted there. You said that um, 
I encountered Varroa in Trinidad in 83. Yes. Uh, the information I have, and I can, the Inspector Paris at the time is hopefully on site, was that we had Varroa in Trinidad. It was first identified in July 96. All right. Well, I, 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 I don't know if you know of um, um, Andrew Telesford. Yeah. Andrew Telesford is a beekeeper in, in San Fernando, Point of Pear area there. And I could call him on his phone now. That is where we used to, to do it, and that's where the first I was first introduced to it. Because in that time, that's where I went. They, they actually introduced me into beekeeping. And, yes. um, and, I, and in 1983, I went there. Um, all right, so I, I, I hear you, and you know, I, I got your date. I saw that did a, a paper on it, but I'll consult. Now, if I could, um, Mr. Mohammed Halim. Halim is saying, you see, there's a note it was Belouse as opposed to Baro. Mr. Halim, could you confirm the date of Baro, please? I don't know if he's um well he's, he's I think he's hearing us because he was able to type in something. Well, I was in Trinidad in 1983, but I, I I did quite a back and forth of traveling because but I started in 1983 in Trinidad. And that is when I was introduced, or we, we spoke about it, and that is how it was treated, or uh, by smoking the hive. But if you say 96, that's when you have the information. I am not going to try to er erase your information, but that is when I was confronted with it. Got you. I know Mr. Dennis Ford. So I'll, give, I'll, I'll check with them as well, just for verification. All right. Um, that's on another point. Um, I, there's a few, I'm just going to just highlight some of the issues that the, the, the pathogens, um, the pathogens that the Viromite does spread that can be harmful to bees are not harmful to humans. So to make that clear. But um, So I'm just going to read out some of them. Um, deformed wing virus, DWV. So when you see the, the, you know, you might see in your hive bees with wings that look totally screwed up that they can't fly. Um, you know, it looks like they've been through a washing machine or a, a grinder or something like that. They've been had a tough fight. Um, you also, oh, shucks. You also have um, Kashmir B virus. That's another virus that's spread through the um uh, through the viral mite i also got acute bee paralysis um israeli acute paralysis slow bee paralysis and parasitic mite syndrome and lastly kagu virus so these are some of the, the key viruses that the viral mite can spread and one of the things you also have to be mindful of is that not only are these viruses spread, um, I think, horizontally from B to B, but they can be spread vertically from queen to daughter through the eggs. All right. Um, so these are things that you need, even though you may not see the the the, the viral mite there, traces of them being there can be still live on and pass through the pass vertically through um through the cyst through through the um from generation, from, generation. from generation to generation right. so it is really so it is really one, one of the other things that i'm pressing for um i, I know myself and gladstone have spoken about this and maybe my colleagues in argentina uh, could assist me in in this endeavor uh, one of the things that we're trying to achieve for the Caribbean is a baseline study of exactly what viruses are present in our bees across the Caribbean. Um, so this would give us a, another indication, okay, well, our bees are suffering from, if it's Israeli paralysis virus, 
maybe th th this is a, a direction we need to go into eradicate that or how we're going to address we can find ways and means of addressing these problems but without us knowing actively what is going on in our ecosystem we're kind of like just moving blindly um I, you know and it, it and the discussion of veromite leads to a whole other you know deficiencies that probably are active in our in our beekeeping community i mean if you've got a pig or a cow or a goat i'm sure you can your vet can just take a blood sample um and if they can't run it run a run a test on it here in st lucia they could send it to our lab and they can get information quite quickly as to what's wrong with your your animal whereas bees an industry which we're really trying to develop there is absolutely nothing there's no fallback for us uh i, I mean that that not even in our ministries of I, I i can i can't speak to the other islands in any detail but i can speak to what's available in solution and there is zero if i said to if i go i mean and there's, there's some things that we've identified to our local veterinary department before they were even aware of it all right you know and veromite was rampant in other islands prior to getting to St. Lucia. What preventative measures were taken to ensure that it, was, it, didn't, it didn't get here? Because, you know, and, and if there was a, and we're now in a system where the Veromite is rampant across St. Lucia, and there is still not a, a management system in place island-wide to say, listen, guys, we need to get this Veromite problem under control. And we need all of you to at least at, in the month of January, in the month of June, in the month of September, to test your colonies of bees and send us some data so that if there is a need for us to help you in acquiring a mitocide treatment or giving you um, local treatments, uh, advising of local treatments to address a problem, that we can do it. You've got the new, the new mite, the Tropolalips, um, which is, emerging out of asia also and it's marching partly across africa so it's on its way and the reproductive cycle of that is even more efficient than the veromite i mean if you lose about 50 percent of the veromites that are ever produced but how about something even imagine you had a hive with triple laps and veromite at the same time <laughs> that's a recipe that's a recipe for disaster so we really need to, just as we as human beings, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're now very conscious of viruses and, and you know, coronavirus and, you know, all these kind of, you know, all our cleanliness and stuff like this. We really need to start looking at our bees in more detail because there are new emerging threats that are on the horizon all the time. Right? And we really need to, to, to bear that in mind. So, um, Yes, we got a couple of questions, so I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> yes, um, Ms. George, go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. I am new to beekeeping, and I'm hearing about the veromite treatment that um, you're speaking about. But what I want to know, um, how effective is this? I, I, maybe I missed it. How effective is, it, is this treatment? And also... Um, does it guarantee that it eliminates the veromite, or how often do you have to treat the hives with this um, with this stuff? And so I just like some clarity on that. Yeah, um, veromite is something that you need to look for. It may not be present in your vite, in your in your colony of bees. You're in Antigua, correct? Yes, I am. Okay, so you're in a great position. So Antigua, mainland Antigua, um, does have for uh, has 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 does have for uh, Mike, We did some I did some tests there with um, the Ministry of Agriculture and um, Scotty from your 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 president of your local beekeeping organization. Uh, we did identify for uh, Mike being present in Antigua. However, the good news is. The, your, the wonderful island of Barbuda that makes up your, the Federation of Antigua and Barbuda 
is, has, is we found no mites there at all. And we tested a number of colonies in Barbuda um, and we found no traces of varroa mite in Barbuda at all. So, um, which is very, very good news for you um, because hopefully for a project that we're assisting the guys in Barbuda in doing in Antigua and Barbuda is that we'll be able to get colonies, do a, have a breeding station in Barbuda and send nice clean bees across the Antigua, which will have no, no mites, no potential viruses with them. And you'll have nice colonies of bees to work with. So if you want to, um, as a beekeeper, to start to, to try as be as chemical free or as treatment free as possible, you have a wonderful opportunity as long as you monitor for viral mites and if you see traces of them coming in and you try to tell your neighbors who, if they're neighboring apiaries that they need to monitor as well for mites so that all it's not because your bees are, are foraging in a three to four mile radius so it doesn't make sense you having viral free bee for well, viral free mite bees and the two or three apiaries next door to you are full of viral at some point these bees will drift or come in contact with one another and your bees will become infested with this small mite. So there is good hope for you. It's something that you need to regularly, regularly monitor. There is a test kit you can buy. It's called Easy Check. It's basically a little plastic container with a sieve in the top of it. You put 100 bees, you, 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 you drop 100 bees inside of it approximately. There is a gauge. There is a measuring line inside of it. You fill it with rubbing alcohol. You shake it for a minute or two. Uh, what will happen is that the mites will dislodge from the bees and they will drop to the bottom of the container and you'll be able to count how many varroa mites are at the bottom. Um, the mites will be very small, about the size of a pinhead, but they'll be like an orange reddish in color and you'll see their little uh, tentacles um, and or, or their legs, sorry, their legs their legs and their mouths like similar to ticks and and you'll be able to count them off if you've got a threshold that's i think the threshold is in the in the off season three mites to every 100 bees and in the active in the peak season is two mites to every 100 bees um if you find yourself in a range of 9 10 11 12 mites you need to take action immediately because that means you have an infestation in your colony where you can use the Ulan Cat product or a whole variety of other products on the marketplace that you can use to treat the bees. Uh, the Ulan product, I can speak to the Ulan Cat product and I probably speak to Vitabee's product, Apigard, because these are two products I've used historically. Um, both of these are organic products, they're not chemical based products. The problem with the chemical based products, which were, were developed in the 70s and 80s and 90s, is that they leave a chemical residue. Um, in in the wax and in the in, and in the box, uh, which will stay there for quite some time. Where with the organic products, there is no chemical residue left in the box, or hopefully in the wax. And no resistance, basically. and there's no resistance as well. The bees will not build a resistance up to the product. Um, so the I can speak to the Olan Cap product. It's a 42 day treatment, so you will get two brood cycles. Uh, a brood cycle is a 21-day period. So your worker bee, it takes the, the from from being laid as an egg for it to emerge as an adult bee, takes 21 days. So during the period of it, what happens with the varroa mite, if you haven't understood, is that when the when the uh, the cell is due to be capped, the larvae will re release a pheromone which tells the other worker, the nurse bees, to come and cap the cell. But the varroa mite is also looking for that same pheromone. I said, oh, you're going to be capped. I said, well, I'm going to go into that same cell just before they cap you so I can eat your, eat, eat, consume your, 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 your fat body while you're, you're in your gestation period before you emerge. All right, so... You want to do two brood cycles so you capture those that are inside the cell already and those that emerge from the cells so that's why it's a 42-day treatment if you use apigard which is a thyme oil is which is based on a thyme oil um in a suspended gel 
Um, I think it's two 14 day treatments. You do two, yeah, two 14 day treatments. Um, five, 10 days, but I actually use yeah. three. You use three. three. Use three, yes. Use three. Okay. So prescribe is two. Two, yes. Yeah. All right. So it's two treat two 10 day treatments. Um you you would apply this in a little uh, in a little uh, a dish. The bees will walk on it. The smell will affect the the mites, and they'll fall off. The bees will throw them outside. Or if you're using a screen bottom board, whilst you're doing this treatment, the bees the mites will fall through the screen bottom board onto the floor, and die. Um, it also prevents the mites from breeding. Yes, because the pheromone interacts with the smell on them. Yes, uh, so it prevents it's them breeding. from breeding. Yes. Yes. All right. So these are two treatments that you can use. Um, but the key to the, the, I think the underlining rule, what we're saying is that um, before you spend money on treating, because your bees might be have no mites and you would have spent money on treating them, um, is to check for the mites first. Do a mite check first, establish the level of if there are mites in your hive and if they're beyond the threshold. Once they're beyond the threshold, you take corrective action. And I think that's the story we're trying to get across is that observe, test, take correct, corrective action as you see as you see fit. I hope that's answered your question, Miss George. I hope I didn't give you too convoluted a, a response. Yes, thank you for responding. Yes. So you um I, so what you're saying is that it cannot the treatment cannot be done in isolation. So it doesn't make any sense. Um, they have varomite, for instance, if they have varomite here in, on the island, um, if I treat my hive and the other beekeepers aren't treating theirs, then it will reoccur in my hive. It is a possibility yes. that can reoccur. Yes. yes. I, I know Mr. George's and Scotty, probably in the new year, are going to gonna campaign to really bring awareness to beekeepers in, in Antigua and Barbuda to monitor for the presence of varomite and to take correction some sort of correction action corrective action as they see fit but they must be aware of the problem moving forward yes mr solomon please yeah i just Thank wanted you. to um add a word of caution in the use of of ap i mean i've i've tried it after maybe about Two, three years of Apistan. Um, it is extremely potent. I use the recommended doses. I, I as a matter of fact, I still have a, a three kilo um container and I have the smaller um sachets. And I've used the, the minimum amount less way less than recommended. And because maybe it was the bees' first exposure to it, but in several colonies, the bees were outside the hive. I raised it with the people at um, Vita Europe, but I um, can't remember the name, but I, I, I ran into a couple of them at a congress. And um, yeah, they say, well, better, you know, I, but I on my own would have discontinued. I don't know whether it had to do with the humidity or the temperature where I am. But the release of vapor caused the bees. I've never seen it before. It was, you know, experience to me. Everybody was outside on the front of the hive. They didn't swarm or anything, but they wanted no part of that. The the vapor was way too strong um, for them. Apis stand fine. Apis garden. I know. Gladstone, it's a good point you've made there. Yeah. Um, I, I have, I'm one that used, used to use Apigard. Um, I reduced on the amount of product I use as well. And I also would crack the, the cover. So air circulation could, uh, it, the, the hive would, it could vent a little bit. I wouldn't, uh, keep them so isolated and I would allow the air circulation so that it would vent. I would either put a stone, if I was using a telescopic cover, I would yeah, just put it on the edge uh, and what it rest means. of the edge. Yeah. Or I would if or I'd put a stone, a small stone, just to raise it so that help with the ventilation. Um yeah. but yes, uh, it's something I have observed. Ellen Ellen has a, a comment to make as well. So let Ellen, Ellen have his piece. 
Thanks. Here in Argentina, we have since 10 or 15 years ago, uh, two or three products with Daimon. Uh, and before Alvin Cup, mostly organic uh, beekeepers uh, use products with Daimon. But there were just a few that was the, 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 the bad news. We, we had before Alvin Cup a, a few beekeepers that has organic production because it was very, very difficult to work with Daimon in different kind of product. In the, uh, it's not important the lab, just the, 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 the drug. Because uh, here in Argentina, it's more difficult than in your country because our world changed a lot every day, the temperature. Mostly. So the dosification is really, really difficult. And the, the efficacy of Taimol is not as good as a uh, uh, slow release strip of oxalic acid. Change a lot because of the stability, because and, uh, of the contact of the product. And the other uh, thing that we have seen uh, here in Argentina with Taimol is that uh, the first thing is Bees don't like it at all and has, in, in, in several doses, uh, has a, a negative effect on bees and is a, 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 toxic, a toxic molecule for human too. Uh, it, it's not as easy as, uh, as another organic compound. So uh, here in Argentina, I, I, I think that more than five, six years, nobody is more using Thymol products because of mostly of these problems. Uh, it's more easy, effective and, and secure for bees and humans to use a slow release strip of oxalic acid. Yep. Good point. Thank you, Ellen. I, and I was just looking at my Facebook page. It just came up on my screen. You were here two years ago, uh, December 8th. <laughs> we were in the field together. So <laughs> it's, it's very interesting that today we are both uh, presenting two years later. Um, if there are any more, anybody's got any more comments or points they wish to make, um, it's now... 11.32. I think we ran a little half an hour longer than we expected to run. Um, anybody has any more points? Brother Gladstone, um, Mr. Halim, any, any comments from you, sir? Nobody? Anybody? Um, Rudy, any last words from you? John. I'd just like to say oh, I'm looking I'm forward to trying the the alien cap so so rich um we need to get some into tobago here yes yeah I, I would definitely be doing that i will i will bring some in I'll, I'll hopefully if as i said i want to see brother rowley man i need to maybe give him some <laughs> give some solution around for him man to, to, to calm his nerves <laughs> up to put a good thing. <laughs> All if right. I do come across to bring him some rum for Christmas, yeah, bring him, I would definitely walk with a pack, of, a pack of for you. Yeah, some of the strong stuff, he needs it. All right. All I would say is that you need to employ every weapon you have in your armory for fighting the Varroa. Try to use the integrated uh, um, system. Try to use um, uh, non-chemical treatments if you can first and use the chemicals, whichever one you choose, only after you have done your uh, alcohol wash and you find out whether you have to treat or not. And make sure that your bees are actually well nourished. That's more important than anything else. If your bees are malnourished, if they are stressed, because perhaps you've taken all that crop away and um, they are stressed, then all sorts of ailments, they may be present in the hive, will flare up. But if they are in a good heart, properly nourished, um, whatever viruses they come across, and trust me, you will find all sorts of viruses in all colonies, yet there may be no symptoms. There may be no clinical symptoms at all, yet if you analyze it, all viruses that exist, and there's about 25 of them, may be present. 
So uh, what's important more than anything, not to hit them with one chemical or another, yes. but to maintain as healthy population, as well nourished, in good heart, and then they will be able to fight whether it is varroa or viruses or whatever else. So just to have one thing in mind to fight against varroa is a bit of a mistaken attitude to take. Yeah. That's all I Rudy, would say. Rudy, could I, could I ask you a question? You indicated yes. sure, that sure. in your years of beekeeping, since um, varroa got to the UK, you've never had problems with varroa. Could you elaborate, please? Is it? Yeah. I never found varroa a problem in my hives. I have problem, I have lots of problems with my bees, but not one of them is varroa. I'm not saying I don't have a varroa. I do have a varroa, but it's not manifesting itself as a problem. Uh, it's like having a cold. I often have a cold, but it doesn't stop me functioning. What, I, what problems I do have are invariably linked either to management failures or uh, perhaps to climatic problems. Uh, I have a problem with nosema. Nobody, knows, nobody wants to know about nosema. It, it, it has a major, major implication for health of my bees. And there is no easy answer to it. You know, I have a problem with viruses. Slow paralysis virus, acute paralysis virus. And again, it all comes back to stress that perhaps I haven't noticed that our bees became malnourished because it was a cold spring. In your case, it may be uh, extended wet season. Um, you have to monitor that sort of thing. And that brings flare up of all sorts of things. But the varroa, it has never been a major problem for me. I'm not saying that I'm not do doing anything against it. I normally, routinely, cut out all the drone comb. I uh, give them a bite of a drone comb and then I cut it out three weeks. I don't necessarily destroy it. I may put it to other colonies which will nurse it until the full maturation. But those colonies are treated, in my case, usually with uh, formic acid. So uh, I don't like to use other acids. Um, so the drones which uh, have all this varroa in it will be saved, um, but it's quite a technical uh, problem to solve. I'm not going to go into it because we would spend all of them talking about it. But varroa has never been a major problem for me. That's all I would say. I don't think it answers your question. It's good to hear from you anyway, Glass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Um, so any closing, any other closing remarks? Solo. I st I'm still going to try and come down and bring some rum for um, Rowley. And I'll walk yeah, in yeah. back. Good All right. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Gladstone. Yes, sir. It's nice, um, like I said, I started this beekeeping in Trinidad. So it's nice um, knowing that there's a Trinidadian on board. But I just yeah, wanted man. to ask you, are you, are you familiar with the Cowie family in Canby? Yeah, Marlon, Marlon, Cowie, and so on. And Carlton and all those people. I know Marlon Cowie Clark, who is a, a, a beekeeper. And uh, the, the Cowies in Canby, well, the dad yes. was a major beekeeper. Uh, right. maybe back in the 90s and so on yeah he was one well, of the yeah, bigger because features. um apart from true that is the tennis but i was also into bigo at one point that kind of yeah. yeah yeah i just wanted to just um just you know recap a bit so since we chatting i got on to andrew telesford and yes. he's going to give you a call okay all right okay all right yeah I have his number too. yes okay all right he said he's got your Thank contact you. right yes Beautiful. yes yeah, we, we we will link in yeah. So thank you. Right. See if Richard Wait, can so bring you down next time. He's coming. No problem. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> well, that, that means that means Paul Keith Rowley will get two bottles around me. So <laughs> bad, you know. I, I, I may have to make a, only get one. Yeah, well, we'll have to make a, a special spice, a spice rum for them boys, man. Back, we'll make a back or two for them boys and, and get them back on track, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So um without further ado, I see my technician is already ushering in oh he's just tidying up i thought you were ush I, I, okay okay so he's telling me he wants to keep it tight so um it's been a pleasure it's been a wonderful three days i think rudy i i've learned Excellent. a lot Excellent. i'm gonna try that um swarming that anti-swarming system please do it's very easy 
Yeah. And the main thing is that you are not going to lose any bees. You know, I, I've heard that you lose up to a third of the bees because they swarm out because they're Africanized and they like to swarm. Well, if you, it's a very simple system. And if you uh, try to prevent the bees from swarming, you're not going to lose any. And your crop will increase because you yes. keep all the bees together and your crop should double, really, for yes. no extra effort. Exactly, you exactly. Know? So I'm, I, that's one caveat I definitely got <laughs> from our three-day um, lecture series. Um, it's been a great intellectual exchange. Um, myself, Richmond, well, not myself, Richmond will be working on editing out all the recordings and hopefully sometime towards the end of next week yeah he's big thumbs up sometimes towards the end of next week we should have um all the recordings up on youtube and available for everybody to watch and learn and and and, and utilize at their leisure um you know i think we should try and make this an annual event so hopefully sue we hope to see you this time next year and Rudy, yeah, definitely so. you guys will be so. here this time next year and we could do it all over again and try to do it this time over year. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, there's too many things going on just before this. So this December period is quite nice, I think. All right. So well, before your active season, yes. uh, you know, before your honey flow starts, is it middle of January or something like uh, it's that? It's towards the end of January. It starts well, going to start. It starts to kick December off. or January is fine because people yes. won't have the time later on. Yes, 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 definitely, definitely. All right. So um, everybody in Argentina, the Ulan Cup team, um, really special thanks for making the time. Um, Gladstone, Mr. Halim in, tr in Trinidad and Tobago. Or is it now Tobago and Trinidad? Guys, it seems Tobago got more balls. <laughs> Either way, it's TT, man. It's still, you all work out which one go first, man. But it's, <laughs> right now, it's Tobago releasing the chat. <laughs> Don't mix politics and beekeeping is a bad combination. <laughs> I know, man. But it's all fun. Um, and our good friend in an, in an, in an, in um, in Antigua, Barbuda. I see it's, um, my lovely friend Deslin Richards is there, and I'm sure she's got about ten or twenty people with her in the room. All right, so Deslin, I, 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 I'm, you know, all the way in St. Kitts, lovely St. Kitts. I love Nevis. I think Nevis is one of the most beautiful islands in the planet. I love, I love Nevis. Big up, big up, big up everybody. <laughs> all right, all right, good, 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 good. good. All right, so and without further ado, um, I'm going to call this proceedings to an end. And now do keep in contact. We will, we will post some links to the Honey Show. Um, all our attentions from now on is for the next, well, at least 12 hours is getting ready for the Honey Show, making sure the town hall is I'm, I'm, I'm sorry? Wow. Everybody. Wow. All right. Okay, guys. Well, it's take time care. Oh, Mister. Ah. Baby, he's walking with that. What do you mean? He's that's a phone, isn't he? Because he can't go outside. All right, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye, bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 All of us. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Keep progressing, everybody. Bye bye. Okay, that's it. Amen. Bye.